For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 47. We're going to look at the subject of premonitions of death. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll fix your day. We're going to, we're going to look, ver, we're going to look at verse, um, well, if you have a study Bible, you can start with 27. Now, Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. <clears throat> Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. Uh, Glenda, a good student, brought that out to me last week. I kept talking about 130 and... See, don't don't short change this now. So <clears throat> they went into the land at 130. Uh, 17 years in the land. That, that, that's a very important strategic point, by the way. Um, actually, in the book of Acts, the seventh chapter. <laughs> but anyhow. Um, when the time for Israel to die drew near... He called his sons Joseph and said to him, to his son Joseph and said to him, Please, if I have found favor in your sight, place now your right hand under my thigh and deal with me in kindness and faithfulness. Please do not bury me in Egypt. And they're going through a, an oath. When I lie down with my fathers, you should carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. That's the patriarch cemetery. And he said, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. So he swore to him. And then Israel bowed to worship at the head of the bed. Your, yours may say on the top of his staff or something, does it? Okay. Now. That tells us that he knew something was up. Now, later it's going to say that he's going to call and say, I'm about to die. But he's already got a heads up. And I'll tell you what's important about this is now we're dealing with chapters 47, 48, and 49, all with the premonition of death. All those chapters are based on the premonition of death. And that's really important because when God gives you a premonition of death, you're to set your household in order, and that's a, that may be bigger than you think. A premonition, I mean, God don't have to give you one because he's already told there's time to, time to be born and time to die, right? So we all know that. <clears throat> and believers, for example, he's the only patriarch that had a, had a premonition. Abraham apparently didn't have one. Isaac didn't have one. Jacob did. So did Joseph. And there was still work to be done that was in their responsibility. And so, uh, Gary may remember this. I don't know if the rest of you, but the colonel had a premonition, and he understood this principle. And in the middle of the night, got up and wrote his will. He, he, he revised it and uh, <clears throat> wrote, wrote a whole thing to everybody in the family and all kinds of things, if you remember that. Uh, he told Bobby, he told, uh, Bobby uh, take me, I'm dying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, I say that to say that he believed in this concept 
of a premonition and understands that there's some things when you, get, when you get a premonition of death and not just have death itself, that there's some things that you should stop and do. Now, the colonel went on to live several more years. I don't remember how many minutes he hoarded, but he lived on several, several more years before he died. Yeah, at least 10. Yeah. So, but it was a wake-up call for him. And he understood this, this doctrine of the premonition of death. And so I, I, want, I think it's important that we study it because I've known people that had them. And I've known other people that didn't. So, Mark did. yeah, Mark did. Yeah. And so it's a good concept to know. It's not, the, it's not to scare you. It's to awaken you to certain things that ought to be done that are on your plate. And nobody else's plate, but on your plate. And this is true with Jacob. I mean, the Lord put it in his heart, you're going to die. And he went, well, whoa, there's some things I need to, there's some, there's some loose ends I need to tie up. And that's chapter 47, 48, and 49. And then the book closes at 50, and God does it again with uh, Joseph. And so we'll talk about that tonight after a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest to offer prayer because of your priesthood responsibility of 1 Peter 2. And for those that are home visiting with us on the Internet, we expect you to do the same protocol for class study. We have this moment of prayer because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the church age. He's there to teach you. You can't study the Bible and get divine truth from it in the flesh or in unbelief. You have to have the Holy Spirit to teach you spiritual truth. So that's, that's a key principle. Now, if you're carnal, you can't study the Bible in carnality. How do I know I'm carnal? Personal sin. <clears throat> what do I do with personal sin? I'm aware of personal sin. Now what? First John 1 John 1.9, if, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us So, <clears throat> from all unrighteousness. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment in your priesthood if you're a believer in Christ. If you're not a believer, what are you waiting around for? Christ died on the cross for your sins 2,000 years ago, was buried and raised from the dead, is alive today, saved the right hand of God the Father, interceding on your behalf through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that's here to convict you of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Let's get that done. Believe. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes the gospel. I just gave you the gospel. Believe it and get this done. Dragging your feet for nothing. For the rest of us, it's prepare our life for, prepare our hearts for the study. Father, we're th thankful tonight. For these that have come our way by automobile and by internet, we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our souls, and we know he will. If we're open to this idea, both by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he will teach us truth. It, not necessarily everything that's said do we get, but we'll get enough said to implement truth into our life and make decisions from it, which will be radical changing called reformation, transformation, transformation, not reformation, transformation. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, start with a question tonight. Why does God give some believers a premonition of death and not all of us? <clears throat> and the answer is, <clears throat> there are, for some who are ready to die on schedule, he gives them a heads up ahead of time because there's some loose ends that need to be tied up. There's some things in your life, um, like, I mean, it could, the, it, could be, it could be spiritual things. It could be family things. It could be work things. I mean, your life, if, if you look at your life like a pie and begin to look at the different aspects of your life, okay, you know, I've got a fam family, I've got a personal family, I've got, I've got a larger family, right? My kin people. <clears throat> how are things going there? I mean, work, how are things going there? Marriage, you know, then there are spiritual issues. 
uh, for Jacob, it involved quite a bit. There were some family loose ties uh, that needed to be fixed. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look at a bunch of things that he realized, whoa, I need to get busy and get these things done because my time is up and my work isn't done. <laughs> my time is up and my work isn't done. So what the Lord is saying, let's get it done and, and let's, leave, let's leave this life cleaned up. Everything, everything cleaned up. Does that make sense to you? <clears throat> it's, it's not a bad thing he's telling you. He's just telling you, look, I want you to take a look in there and let's get some things done. Because your times, your, I see your names on schedule, <laughs> however that worked. <clears throat> now, example, Jacob was the only patriarch that I could, I could find as I look back through the lives of these guys that had a premonition of death. I couldn't find with Abraham, uh, who died at 175. I mean, this guy just goes sleep, he's done. I, I couldn't find one with Isaac. And I, I laid down some passages for you to go in. Um, and take a look at those. And if you are aware of that, I'd like to know it. I couldn't find it, and I couldn't remember it being done. Um, but I was aware of Jacob, and I was aware of Joseph. Now, we read a passage out of Genesis 47 because I wanted you to see that God gave him a heads up, and the good reason was to set your household in order, which was chapter 47, 48, and 49. That's a lot. In the Bible, three great, great big chapters is a whole lot. Um, that God, that God, I want you to get this stuff done. I don't want you to drag your feet. You know, a lot of times we drag our feet on stuff that ought to be done. You know that should be done, but you drag your feet on it for whatever reason. Now the Father says, you ain't got any more time to drag your feet. <laughs> Let's get this stuff done. And so there are some things you will know if you have a premonition of death, you will know that there are some things. It may be a phone call to clean up some things. It may be, um, anyhow. I mean, I don't know what it would be, but you would know. In, in chapter 48, verse 1, I wrote on your paper, now it came about after these things, the things that happened in 47, after he became aware of it, that Joseph was told, your father is mortally ill. Remember, I dealt with mortal illness. Remember that? He says, behold, your father is sick. And he's talking about mortal illness sick. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him because he don't know if he'll see his dad anymore. I mean, this. Then in the 48th chapter, it, I mean, you know, this whole discussion really gets interesting in chapter 48. I, I'm just pulling out certain scriptures, 21 to 22. Then Israel, which is Jacob, said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die. But God will be with you. This is important that he tell Joseph this. Um, that God will be with you and bring you back to the land of your fathers. You know, you know how God is going to bring Joseph back to the land of his fathers? In a what? In a coffin in a casket, in a coffin. But listen, God honors his stuff. And Joseph says, Joseph, just like Jacob, did not want to be buried in Egypt. That was not their land. Isn't that interesting? Now, J Joseph was just about everything in Egypt, wasn't he? He was everything but Pharaoh. Yet he never claimed it to be his land. Right? Never claimed to be his land. Which is kind of interesting. Um, Behold, I'm about to die, but God will be with you. He will bring you back to the land of your fathers. And then he says, I give you one portion more than your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and my bow. That should be not, not my move. That's the words. Must be the U is next to the Y, is it? On the, okay. I don't know. I still, if, if I lose my fingers, I can't. Well, I guess nobody could type, but I type with my, you know, one finger. <clears throat> so 
I want to talk about four things about the premonition of death. Now, remember, he's going to, he's going to do something special. He's wanted to do this. Now he's figured out to do it. Now he's going to do it. He's got a portion of land he's going to give to Joseph that's unique to him. Special. It's special to Jacob. It may not be worth <laughs> You know, people give you the funniest things won't they? when they die. They just think this would be something for you. And uh, you go, what am I going to do with this? And since I gave it to you, you can never get rid of it. So you're hoping as well be done when your kids come along, they'll throw it away because you can't do it. You know what I mean? It was given to me. Uh, probably if they were smart and kept it another century, it would be worth some money, whatever it was, right? Just time, time alone makes it an antique, and then it becomes worth something. But anyhow, um, so here's number one. For one reason, one reason for Jacob's premonition of death was because Joseph, listen to me, this is really important to me at least, that Joseph needed a father talk about the father. Now look, I made the second father with a capital, didn't I? Joseph needed a father talk about, and, and didn't he give it to him? He said, look, your father, your, I'm, I'm going to die, but your father in heaven is going to take care of you. Isn't that good? You... Every person in this room needs to have a conversation with people in your family like that. That's for sure, isn't it? Joseph needed, you know, there's two ways to get closure, one before you die and one after. Everybody talks about closure after somebody dies, never talks about it before. There's some things that closure could come by a conversation with somebody before you die. A well worth conversation too. You understand? Joseph needed that. Joseph needed that before his father died. And his father was smart enough to say, look, I'm going to die. You and I have always had a, a bonding. That now has to go to your heavenly father. And... Uh, the sooner you have that with people you love, the better off they're going to be. In 1997, Jane's father, Mr. Jones, was on his deathbed, and he called for me and wanted me to come by and have a talk with him. He had a premonition, and so I did. And I'll tell you, I think a lot about our conversation. I think a lot about it. It absolutely had an impact upon my mindset regarding my relationship with God as my heavenly father. And he gave me, he had two children, both girls, but he laid the responsibility down on me. He, like Jacob, like adopted me. And he said to me, I have no one to leave my three girls with who I have spoiled. <laughs> Except you. You're a man of honor. I know you will do this. And so I want to talk to you about it. And I found it to be one of the great highlights of honor ever given to me as a human being. And so we, we sat. I got a notebook. So look, look, I can commit all this to memory. <laughs> so let me get a pad and paper. And I wrote it down. What he said about taking care of his wife and his two girls. And... We almost had this moment that Jacob had with Joseph where there was a, almost a swearing of oath to it. You know, where can, can I look right in my eyes and can I count on you, Ron? And, and I'll tell you, I'm a, I got, and I, of course I told him, yeah. When I got in my car on my way home, 
the father said, well, you know, you got one thing for certain. I said, well, what, what would that be? It looks like I got more responsibility. I got a house full of kids, and now I got... And he went, at least you know you're going to out outlive them. And I went, what? <laughs> what? And he went, yeah. And I went, well, thank you. That's it. And we'll see. I have so far, but we'll see. I don't know. His whole talk was me from a, a father and a husband to a godly father. Ron, I know you're the guy that will keep them attached to the heavenly father. I know that. I, and I, I count on that. And I, I have nobody better to do this with. And I thought, well, you got, you got an accountant. You got, you, know, you got a lawyer friend. You, you got a banker. And you got all this and all that. Now, I want somebody. I want somebody that I think has a connection with the Father. And I, that, was a, that, was a high, that was a high point of day for me, I can tell you. Uh, but, but anyhow, in, in Galatians, and so I've tried to do this with my kids. I try to do the same thing with my kids. I try to connect my children when they get to be adults and say, well, I'm going to make my way in the world, Dad. I try to make sure that I, I connect them to the Heavenly Father in every way I can in conversation with them. Well, Dad, I'm just having this. I will. Look, I appreciate this call. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to talk to the Heavenly Father. And then we'll come, we'll come back to me. But we've got to stop. And then before we leave that phone, I, I say to him, you know why we went to the Heavenly Father first and talked? Why? Because there's a day coming when this phone call can't go to me, but it always go to him. See, I think that... And I've learned that. I mean, I, I think that's a principle, and I've learned it from this story, and I've learned it from my own life. That's a thing you ought to do with your kids if you, if you really care about them. That's, that's the deal, isn't it? That's the deal. Well, anyhow, in Romans, uh, in uh, Galatians, Romans 5, 7, 15 through 17, and then Galatians 4, 6 through 7, I wrote the Galatians 4 down. Because you are sons, adopted sons, because you are adopted children, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. You know, I hear people always talk about it and don't believe it in the crunch time. I mean, God is your dad. I mean, he is a daddy that really does care for more, you more. I mean, you may have had the best dad in the world, but he's better. <laughs> you know what I mean? You may have had the worst dad, but he's the best. And that's a wonderful thing. He, he's always the same. He's always consistent. He always deals with the same way, justice, love, mercy, grace. I, I love that about God. I love that about And I love it. There are a lot of things you can call God, and rightly so, all biblical terms. Nothing better than Abba Father. My heavenly dad. I mean, I mean there are a lot of things, man. Therefore, you are no longer a slave. You are a son. If a son, then an heir, an heir through God. The second thing, the second thing that I, I found him, it, kind of unique about this thing of premonition of dead, death is King Hezekiah. Now, King Hezekiah was, is really an interesting guy and well worth your time reading about him. He's mentioned, he's mentioned in um, uh, Isaiah. He's mentioned in 2 Chronicles, in 2 Kings. I mean, he is, and he was a great spiritual reformer. This guy, I mean, he, he listen, he took a nation in worse shape than we got today in regard to God. He took all the heat for changing them. You know, the media didn't like him. You know, the, the politicians didn't like him. The religious people didn't like him. But God did. And he just marched along. He, took, he became a king uh, of Israel when he was 25. 14 years into his stretch, at the age of 39, 
King Hezekiah was deep at war with the world power Assyria. And and buddy, they were they were mo they were on the move. They were eating up land headed towards Israel. They told Israel to surrender your sword now. They sent all kinds of embassies ahead and told the people, you better surrender now. And, they, and there was a lot of proof on, on their way that they were, were merfl, merf, merciless. Sennacherib was the guy running that show at that time. He was merciless. And in the 14th year, they're in, they're in deep battle with Assyria, and Syria is just... They've got, they've got all, they've, they've surrounded Israel and they're ready to just pound them in. And in the 14th year, in the midst of this enormous war that is not going Israel's way, he comes down with mortal illness. Isaiah goes in, Isaiah the prophet to the king and the nation walks in and says to him on the, on the sickbed, you're not going to get up. You're going to die. Thirty-nine years of age. Now, here's what's interesting. He takes when you read his life. It says, Hezekiah took the took became king at twenty-five and reigned 29 years. You know who can predict that? God. You're going to, listen, what do you, listen, God says you're going to live to be 54. But in the 14th year, at the age of 39, he is sick, he is mortally sick, and Isaiah walks in and says, you're going to die, you're not going to live. And so he has this enormous prayer. He has this prayer. And he, he tells God, you know, what we're going to do? I mean, we're in the fight of our life. I'm in, the, I'm in my prime. He was married and didn't have a kid. And I thought about having a kid, but I don't know how the war is going to go. And so... Here's what, the, here's what the Bible says about, about it. And you can read about this in 2 Kings chapters 18, 19, 20, as, and it's well worth your time to read it, in my opinion. But he has this prayer. And I want you to listen. I've been talking a great deal about the details of the directive will of God. Listen, people, most of you, if you've been with me a year, you've got to start paying attention to the details of the word of God. You've got to start paying attention to the details of the Word of God. You've got to start paying attention when God tells you something to pay attention to the details of what he's telling you. Now, I want you to listen to this because I, I put in bold print on your paper, I will. That's the will of God that we're talking about under point number two. Listen to what God said to him. Now, he's mortally sick. He's going to die. Isaiah walked in and said, you're, on, you're not going to get up. You're dead. Okay. Listen, this is what God told him. This is, this is how God answered his prayer. He said to him, I will add 15 years to your life. He's 39. If you add 15, you're going to get to 54. I will, I will add 15 years to your life. That's the first. Second, I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the Assyrians. That's two. I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Think that sound important? Hey, I'll tell you the guy who's paying attention to the details of the little guy, a guy who's on his deathbed and God is saying, I'm going to will you three things. Not only, not only said, will I get you out of this bed, but I'm going to, listen, I'm going to win the war for you. And, and listen, there, it did not look, that war did not look like it was going well. 
So I learned out of Hezekiah this doctrinal principle. It's in, the sec it's in 2 Kings 20, verse 1. I wrote it at the bottom of your paper. It's a key doctrinal point on the premonition of death. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus saith the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. And then he has his prayer, and God, God gives him the details of his will, right? Fifteen years, be, I'm going to be to Syria, yet he had it. Here's point number three. With the premonition of death, Jacob, that was Hezekiah, and of course Hezekiah got that. God, because God honors his word, doesn't he? <clears throat> sure does. Now, back to Jacob. With the premonition of death, Jacob began setting his household in order. <clears throat> this setting his household in order is going to in involve uh, <clears throat> tribal responsibilities. Do you know he's going to, he's got 12 sons. You know, tw there's 12 tribes in Israel. And he's going to, listen, they're in Egypt, and he's going to, he's going to allot the land to them. He's going <laughs> to, as Joseph is in Egypt, he's going to go home in a casket, and he's willed him some special property. Think about that. You think there's not life after death? Listen, there's life after death from your life to the living. If you're smart about it, he's willing stuff. And listen, some of this stuff is not going to happen for another 400 years. They're going to go, listen, the children, are, Israel is not going to come out of Egypt for another 400 years. He's willing, he's doing all of this and it's not going to come to pass, not even with his kids who are alive when he wills it. It's, it's, it's what? How many generations down? This stuff had to be done. Let's get this done, Jacob. There was personal stuff in the family. There were... The, there were odds within the family. The, the family's disarrayed over this whole thing, isn't it? They sold their brother into Egypt. They don't know what's going to happen when their father dies. The glue that's been holding. They think that the glue that's been holding this whole thing together is uh, Joseph, when in fact it is God, and Joseph knows it's a God, and the brothers still don't know. Chapter 50 is all about that. But listen, Dad knows the mess that's going on. And he's made arrangements for that to be taken care of through Joseph. He's had a conversation. He's mended fences. And he's told Joseph, take care of your, take care of your brothers. This is what your dream. He's going to tell him, Joseph, it's taken me a lifetime to figure out your dream, but now it's reality. You're, the supreme, you're, you're supreme over your family. There's no doubt about that. The reality is here we are. Be honorable with it. You're in that position now. You hold the sword. Be honorable with it. And Joseph was. Joseph was. So there was tribal, I mean, things in the plan of God that has to be done. The families disarrayed. There are things that have their fences that have to be mended and taken care of. And, and there's spiritual connecting uh, earthly father, uh, parents, connecting their children to a heavenly father that will be there generationally all the way down. 400 years out, we're talking in the plan of God. So he begins with instructions to Joseph regarding his burial in chapter 47. Then he rearranges the tribes by adopting Joseph's two sons, right? Then Jacob wills Joseph uh, this special tract of land mentioned in chapter 48, verses 21 to 22. 
that he, of this tract of land that he bought from the Amorites? It's in the New Testament. We don't even pay any attention to that stuff. We just read the New Testament like there's no Old Testament. You know where this tract of land is? It's in Shechem. And you know where that is in the New Testament? Jacob's well. In John 4, Jesus with the woman at Jacob's well. This is that piece of land. That little piece of land that he willed out there. The key part of that whole thing is the historical Jacob's well. That's this track of land. This, th this track of land is mentioned in Joshua 24. I don't know if I wrote this down. But this track of land is mentioned in Joshua 24.32. It's mentioned in Genesis 33.19. It, it, this is where that track of land was picked up, is in Genesis 33, 19, when he bought it from the Amorite. This is Jacob's well in John 4, 5, and 6. And this track of land is mentioned in Acts, the 7th chapter, 15 and 16. You want to have that repeated? John 4, 5, oh, five, five and 6. Chapters? No, no, just John 4, verses 5 and 6. Yeah, it's, J it's, it's John 4. You know, Jacob's well, what? And Acts 7, uh, I wrote down 15 and 16. You see, it's Shechem, this little piece of, this little track of land. I mean, uh, Joshua 24, 32. And then you make sure you get Genesis 33, 19, because that's where he bought from. That, that's, the, that's the deed. Um, and look. This piece of prophecy, this, listen, this is part of this premonition and this thing. Look how far that thing stretched out. That thing stretched all the way out into, this, into the first coming of Christ, into his ministry. And some people, like Jesus in John 4, knew that. And the early church of Acts 7. I mean, you know where that took place? It took place at this premonition of death in Jacob. And what Jacob's doing is setting his household in order. And look how far out that thing's going. You know why? Because he's dealing with the Heavenly Father about things that need to be done. Things that need to be done that are important all the way out to the first coming of Christ. I mean, see, God has a plan after you die. And you can be a part of it. Before you die. Think about that for a minute. And if you get a premonition about your death, you need to pay attention to it because it's bigger than you might think it is. Then Jacob will allot the land to the 12 tribes in Genesis 47, or Genesis 49. And then in the fi final part that he closes, what Jacob gives his burial instructions, he tells you how he wants his funeral run. Oh, that's good. And I'll tell you, you, if you're with somebody like I was with Mr. Jones and he had this premonition, I'd studied that. I went back to him a after I got over the shock of all of it. I went back to him, sat, sat down. I said, listen, we need to talk. And that was quite a conversation because it never dawned on him. I mean, it just dawned on him, you know, will you take care of my girls? I said to him, listen, there's got to be more than that. There's got to be much more than that. I couldn't think of that way at the first because I was just, what has just happened here? But after I went home digested, I went, wait pulled out my old premonition on death and I went, whoa, I need to go back and talk to him. And, and that was a great visit, by the way, because he hadn't thought about that. He hadn't thought about a premonition of death and what all it might entail. And, and, it, and, and listen, it involved more than that. <laughs> listen, this, this thing here, Jacob and dying, this premonition of death is recorded in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 21. It says, by faith, Jacob, as he was dying, 
See, that's, that's that premonition. Blessed each one of, of uh, the sons of Joseph and worship leaning on top of his staff. That's where they get that from. Uh, maybe you're said at the head of the bed or something. I don't know what to say. The head of his staff. Here, here is a fourth thing. We see this setting his house in order, which is part of that premonition, with Joseph's premonition of death in Genesis 50, 24 through 26. I'm going to give it to you in two parts. In the first part, Joseph says to his brothers, I'm about to die. Whoo, that's a big clue. I'm about to die. That's not something the doctor tells you. That's something the Lord tells you. The doctor can say you're sick and I may not, you may not get up again. You've got a mortal illness, but who knows? But when, you, when, he, when Joseph said to his brother, I'm about to die, listen to what he says. God will surely, that, that word surely is where you get a doubling up in the Hebrew. And it means something absolute. That's why the English don't know what to do with that, like muth muth that, you know, don't eat of the tree, die and you will die business. But it means something absolute, 100%. I, and here's what he's saying. And, and listen to the details now, the details of the will of God. I'm about to die. Now, he's talked to his brothers. That was, that was his father's big deal, wasn't it? Was part of it. God will surely take care of you. I'm going to die. You're going to be in Egypt. You're, our dad has died, and I'm about to die. And, I, and listen, you think that I'm the guy who's kept, kept you? I was sent to preserve you. I haven't kept you. God has kept you. And I'm leaving, him, I'm leaving you in his hands. See, he's doing the same thing his dad did. That's what, that's what godly people do. God will surely, absolute, 100% take care of you, and that's what he's telling them, and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And boy, that's going to drop down into a lot of descendants of these 12 tribes before they leave that isn't it? I mean, this is a word that's got to be passed on down the pike. This is a will that has to be told to every generation. Do you understand that? To get out of there with any kind of sense. When things get tough, this is the stuff they've got to go back to and say, look, I know one day I may not get out of here, but my children will. They had hope because of the word of God. And then the second part, Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath. God will surely, absolutely take care of you and you should carry. So he made him swear a double oath again. I want you to go back. You're going to leave here. You are going to leave this land. Your family somewhere is going to leave this land. And when they leave, I want you to swear to me they will take my bones back to my, my fatherland. That's where you get this concept of fatherland. Carry my bones up from here. So Joseph dies at the age of 110. He was embalmed, placed in a coffin. That coffin, is he's, that's going to remain for 400 years before his body is removed. This is mentioned in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 22. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus. How about that? Of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. And so there's a principle here for us. Joseph's bones in Egypt's coffin with the royal seal on it was a sign of the promises made to the patriarchs and their descendants. God will surely, absolutely, 100% take care of you. Buddy, if there's one thing you should walk away from this lesson with, that's the promise God makes to us. God will surely take care of you, absolutely, 100%. And 
in the church age, how do we, how do we bring this to our meaning? Well, 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 9 says, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confer, confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, because God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want to give you a little Bible study for home on this idea of premonition, because one was given to Moses, and it's as important as any ones I've talked about. You're going to find it in Deuteronomy 32, 48 through 52, when Moses is on Mount Nebo. What you want to pay attention to is the verses I've given to you that's connected with Moses dying on that mountain. You want to be sure you read Jude 9. You want to look at Hebrews, I mean, Revelation 11 and Matthew 17, 1 through 3. Because Moses, too, was told to set your house in order. Okay? It's on your paper. Mm -hmm. All of that's on your bottom. Home study. Yeah, I just recommend that to you. It's a wonderful study. And I knew I wouldn't have time to really do it and still have prayer and all that. So, But you'll get the idea from it. And, and this is, I mean... Uh, in the New Testament, people are going to have the same thing. Uh, Paul has it. Peter has it. Uh, and you may have it, you may not have it. But if you have it, or if someone you love and you're standing by their bed and they're giving it to you, pay attention to it. Pay attention to it. Because it, they may not even be aware of what, the, what, what kind of meaning that has to them. Uh, and so you're able to bring that back and say, well, like I did, Mr. Jones, this may be, this may be bigger than what you think. Let's sit down. Let me sit down and talk a little bit about that. And, and, and it was true. It, it was bigger than he thought. There was more things in it. And he went, I don't know right now. I said, well, look, look, this will... You'll get it. Write it down. There was a tablet next to him. I said, write this stuff down. I'll come back and talk to you tomorrow. And uh, we did that several times, and that was true. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll close this session. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're always in control. When we're not, you are. When we are, you are. Therefore, it doesn't have anything to do with us except for our journey. We, we would be so, so smart to walk by faith and not by sight, to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the flesh, in every situation of our life because it gives, it gives purpose and meaning to it. We've looked tonight at the premonition of death and what it could mean for us as believers. I mean, some wonderful things. Some wonderful things that are undone that should be done before you leave and not leave it to somebody else. It's a responsibility. God wants you to take care of that. You take care of that. And uh, sometimes people think, well, I can't do that because I'm bedridden. The truth of the matter is people can come to you and you can resolve it. They did in these cases. Joseph called them to come to his cha bedchamber and discussed with them. He didn't get up and go to them. They got up and came to him. And God makes all these prearrangements for us. And so we think about these things. We think about them. But the greatest part of this whole message is that we have an Abba Father. We're part of the royal family of God through Jesus Christ, and we're so thankful for that. And you take care of all the little things. Even when Hezekiah was worried about warfare and how it would go for his nation, God says, I got handled. I have it handled. Whether you're here, whether you're here or with me, I still have a handle. I mean, sometimes we just think that we have to handle all of it. And it was a good experience for King Hezekiah to understand. Listen, God still has it. Whether you die or live, it just depends on whether or not you want to be a part of it. 
whether God wants you to be a part of it. God is always 100%. God will surely 100% do what he's promised. That's Romans 4.21, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life.